Hello. Uh, last time we were talking about um, a triatomic molecule, and we were looking at its um, uh, longitudinal vibrations, meaning vibrations of the molecule along its um, um, its configuration, meaning the line along along the line over which its atoms are placed. Okay, and we looked at the normal modes, and I was also mentioning that I will uh, take up further on molecules. But uh, I've changed my plan. I think it will be better if I take one more example of um, another system before we look at molecules. Um, or maybe it will be better if um, I skip molecules altogether and you can um, study more about it. Um, you can find good content in, in Landau, Landau and Lifshitz. Anyhow, so for now, let's take up a uh, next example of this and we are looking at coupled pendulums now. Okay, so that's what we'll do. So let me draw the um, setup of a coupled pendulum. So we here have two pendulum which are coupled by a spring. Okay, so let me draw this. So this is the ceiling from which I will hang to pendulum. This is the vertical direction. Okay. And let me try to fill in some color to make it brighter. Uh, let's say you have one pendulum with some mass here and another one here. Let's say the masses are same. Okay, both the masses are same. Um, and then there is a spring which connects them. So you have a spring here which connects the two. Okay. Mm, yeah. And the angles here I will denote by these angles I will denote by Q1 and Q2. Okay. These are as you know, our generalized coordinates, okay? And of course, as uh, these two pendulum move, the spring will get stretched or compressed and it will store potential energy. Let's say the length of the pendulum is L. Both of them are of same length. Masses are M, as I've said. Uh, that's fine, okay? So, um, that's good. So if you write down the kinetic energy and potential energy, you'll find the following. The Let me change the color back to black. Okay. okay. Uh, this will be uh, the kinetic energy here. So T half ML square Q1 dot square plus Q2 dot square. <clears throat> okay, that's good. And the potential energy will have two components, one coming from these uh, masses getting uh, moving in the gravitational field of Earth. So that gives you half mg L Q1 square plus Q2 square. Okay, this you can easily find. And then the other piece comes from the spring, okay? The because the spring is getting stretched, and that gives a contribution of so you know you half k x squared. That the same thing here. So you get half k. So k is the spring constant. L square. Q1 minus Q, I can write Q2 minus Q1, it doesn't matter, square. So these are the two quadratic forms that we have and which we would like to put as sum of squares, which we have been doing earlier, and that is what you do by normal coordinates. But given the experience we have already with the previous example, we can almost guess what the normal coordinates would be and completely avoid doing the uh, algebra of finding out the eigenvectors of 
um, I mean find, finding out all the eigenvalues and then building up the transformations which put them in quadratic uh, in, as sum of squares okay so it will I will give you an exercise check that um, q1 and q2 defined by the following relations okay so this is guesswork and it works so what you can guess is the following you can guess that if i define q1 to be q1 plus q2 over square root of 2 okay of course this whether this is square root of 2 and some other coefficients is one can easily fix but the point is that you can guess that i should use such a such a combination q1 plus q2 and q2 to be 1 over ml square q1 minus q2 okay so check that q1 and q2 defined by these two relations turn the quadratic forms t and u into sum of square turn the quadratic forms t and u into sum of squares all you have to do is put these two definitions in in t and u and check that indeed you get sum of squares now um, of course if you invert these relations which i have written then you'll get the following you'll get q1 as ml square q1 plus q2 over square root of 2 and q2 to be ml square q1 minus q2 over square root of 2 and um, so i mean i could have started by saying that this is what you can guess that i should define a q1 to be sum of this and q2 to be a difference of this and you can um, guess this because let's say if you define it this way i mean we are doing why uh, what i'm trying to say is how to guess that these will be the modes without doing the algebra so let's say if you define these as the modes then when q1 is uh, q2 is 0 okay then you will have q1 equal to q2 meaning both the pendulum here this guy and that guy will be moving in the same direction so if this goes in this direction that also goes in that direction and clearly it looks like that will be a mode right because this entire setup will be then oscillating with one frequency because this spring will not get strange stretched or compressed at all okay and these two guys will move as if there were no connection between them and they will be moving at the same frequency so you'll have uh, a normal mode okay so that is how you can guess this part and clearly if you have guessed this you can uh, also think that okay maybe i should put q1 plus q2 and you will realize that indeed that is important if you wish not to disturb the t okay so yeah please check this and uh, try to see that you can um, I mean it, it's kind of understandable that these are the choices which you should make and if you don't like you do the algebra which we have done earlier and arrive at these okay okay so once you do the exercise you will be convinced that these are indeed the uh, right coordinates and in these coordinates i um, will get the following so check that you get t equal to half q1 dot square plus q2 dot square so indeed it is not disturbed it was anywhere some some of squares here so we had to ensure that we don't disturb it but the q now becomes a sum of squares and this is what you should verify q1 square plus half 
g over l plus 2 k over m q2 square okay and there is no no cross term no cross terms involving q1 and q2 okay that's good so what are the characteristic frequencies of the system these are the characteristic frequencies. so square root of this is let's we will call omega 1 and square root of this thing we will call omega 2 okay these are our uh, frequencies of the normal modes this is omega 1 square and this is omega 2 square okay and let's go to the next slide so our system has the following characteristic frequencies okay so one is omega 1 g over l that you know that is of a simple pendulum and it's not surprising that this is what you get as, as I explained a couple of minutes ago and omega 2 is g over l plus 2 k over m square root which is again uh, you can write as this omega 1 which is what I've taken out 1 plus alpha okay where alpha is 2k over m this entire thing divided by g over l okay and alpha is clearly greater than 0 so one thing you notice is the frequency omega 2 is larger than omega 1 because alpha is greater than 0 and you may wonder why that is the case and here is you can see that um, see when q2 is at rest it's that that mode is not activated only q1 is there okay so q2 at rest means q1 is small q1 equals q small q2 meaning these two pendulums are moving in the same direction together without stretching this okay that is the mode and clearly when q1 is 0 and the other mode is activated these two are going in opposite directions right because when q1 is 0 you get q1 small q1 equal to minus small uh, q2 and in that case in that mode this spring is getting stretched or compressed so more potential energy is, is stored in that mode right so when that mode is active there is more potential energy that you can store one is in the, gravi um, the, the gravitational potential energy of these two masses plus the plus the um, potential energy stored in the in the spring okay and that is what leads to higher frequency in this mode okay okay that's good um, okay now let's write it down anyway whatever I have said so mode 1 omega 1 is g over l square root that's our mode 1 which means that my q2 is 0 of course this is this is not active so the frequency of this one is what I am writing down um, and this implies that q1 is equal to q2 as I said and in this mode both the pendulum move in the same direction okay spring remains unstressed or uncompressed okay so here what it looks like which I've been saying now for some time so here both uh, 
angles will be same doesn't look like okay and they are moving in the same direction okay that's what you have mode 1 and then mode 2 your omega 2 is omega 1 1 plus alpha okay and as I said before q1 will be 0 and you will have q1 equals minus q2 okay moving in opposite directions and here the situation is this it does not look like straight okay so here you have the vertical so let's say this guy is going this way then this guy will go this way in a symmetric fashion and of course um, the spring is stretched or compressed when they are returning backwards they will it will get compressed okay okay so this is your mode 2 also note that when you have your system oscillating in one of the modes the visual um, that you get in front of you so if you are looking at this uh, this this system oscillating in one mode what you see in front of you, you is a shape which does not change with time because all parts are uh, moving with the same frequency okay I, I will clarify this point a little uh, in, a, in a bit more but uh, <coughs> what I'm saying is as time goes on if you have your system oscillating in one particular mode then the shape which is in front of you does not change with time it just becomes smaller and bigger okay or remains the same that's what will happen so for example if you look at this one this one is it will look identically like this at a later time also so for example it will become I this pendulum will get here that pendulum will get here at a later time but the shape looks the same it's not that this guy will be two meters away and this guy will be one meter away that will change the shape okay but these two look uh, uh, the but this will look the same at all the times it will be just looking bigger or smaller whether it is more out or uh, less out that is what is going to change with time so the the visual perception of uh, what you have in front of you in a particular mode does not change with time it just only becomes bigger or smaller and the reason is because all the parts are moving with the same frequency when you are in a normal mode okay and that the reason is because you are let's say when you are in a particular mode q1 for example in this case okay all the small q's they all oscillate with the same frequency right that should uh, that you should be able to immediately convince yourself because the small cues are just a linear combination of the big cues for example here this q1 is just a linear combination of these right q2 is linear combination of these so if let's say q2 is absent here because we have put it to rest then whatever frequency q1 has the omega 1 is the same thing uh, q1 will, will oscillate with and the same for q2 so in a normal mode all parts um, oscillate with the same frequency but some of the parts may be at rest for example in the case of triatomic molecule when you had a symmetric mode the center particle the one with mass capital m located at x2 that was not moving okay so either all the parts move with the same frequency or, or some of the parts may be just at rest okay but in general uh, if you are not in a if your system is not oscillating in a particular mode then uh, this is not true so different parts uh, will be moving with different frequencies anyway we'll come back to all this in more detail later but for now let's um, continue with this um, example so good that we have found the characteristic frequencies by guessing the 
normal modes, um, normal coordinates. Now there is a nice phenomena which happens in this example. Imagine this spring which connects the two pendulum here. It's very weak, okay, very feeble. So that the um, interaction between these two pendulum is very small. Which means, let's say you start with your pendulum, both of them hanging down straight, uh, nothing happening. And at some point you decide to nudge one of these gently, so that you are doing small oscillations, okay. That will not immediately disturb this, okay, because the, the coupling is very weak. And that is what we want to look at and we'll see something very nice that comes out of that algebra which is usually demonstrated in demonstrated in classrooms. So here I have redrawn the setup. Okay. And by uh, showing this spring, I am assuming a very small coupling. And what we are going to see is that there will be an exchange of energy between the two. I'll exchange of energy between the two pendulums. And this is the phenomenon of beats. Let me explain to you what's going to happen. Okay, so as I said, um, so what, what we'll see is that at, let's say at time t equal to zero, you gently move it this way. Now, uh, because the coupling is very small, it will not immediately push it away. Okay, so it will. You you will see what starts happening to it. It will. You'll see that it will start moving slowly a little bit, and something very interesting will happen eventually. So that's what we want to see. So first point is that spring constant is small. Okay, which ensures that the coupling between the two pendulum is also very feeble. Okay. Which amounts to saying that my alpha is much smaller than one, the alpha which I defined here, it's here. Okay, this quantity, because this is controlled by K. Anyway, so as I said, let's both of them be hanging down and then at some point, which we call t equal to zero, we will give first one, let's say this this was the q1 which we were saying and this is the q2. So at this time, we give q1 a gentle velocity, okay? So q1 at t equal to zero, let's call it v0. Okay, so this is what we do. So our conditions, initial conditions at time t equal to zero are the following. Okay, so you have both the pendulum at rest. So even if you give a gentle nudge at time t equal to zero, it will still be at zero. Q2 is also equal to zero. And if you look at the velocities, your Q1 dot is v0 so we have given it a velocity we have not done anything to the second one so at time 2 equal to 0 this will still be at rest okay and this translates to the following for the normal coordinates so the same initial conditions if you look at uh, look for the normal coordinates they translate to the following so this you can check immediately that at time t equal to 0 this is all at t equal to zero, okay, whatever I'm writing here. Um, okay, so q1 will be same as q2 and it will be zero. Just because the small q1 and small q2 are zero and capital q1 and capital q2 are linear combinations, so they will also be zero. And you can also immediately see that q1 dot will be ml square over 2 in the square root times v naught and q2 dot will be ml square over 2 in the under root times v naught. 
okay now we can solve for small q1 and small q2 easily because we know that the capital q1 and capital q2 the normal modes are anyway harmonic oscillators so uh, clearly that q1 is the most general solution is a1 cos omega 1t plus c1 sin omega 1t right that's the most general solution and similarly for q2 you have a2 cos omega 2t plus c2 sin omega 2t okay and now if i put my initial conditions then you will let me just write initial conditions they imply that um, a1 and a2 are zero why because see q1 and q2 are zero at time t equal to zero so clearly when i put t equal to zero these two should vanish otherwise i mean this will vanish but this will give non zero contribution unless a1 and a2 are zero so clearly the initial conditions imply that a1 is same as a2 and they are both zero okay that's one thing now we still need to determine c1 and c2 which you can get by using these two at the initial time which are at the initial time and check that you get the following uh, check that c1 turns out to be m l square over 2 square root v naught over omega 1 and c2 is m l square over 2 v naught over omega 2 okay and this will be easy to verify um, also you can immediately check that if you substitute all these um, um, constants which you have determined just now in the definition of q1 and q2 not definition uh, uh, the expression of q1 and q2 in terms of capital q's the normal coordinates you are going to get the following so check that q1 is v naught over 2 um, sine omega 1 t over omega 1 plus sine omega 2 t over omega 2 ok and for q2 we get again similar looking thing but with a minus sign sin omega 1 t over omega 1 minus sin omega 2 t over omega 2 ok that's uh, easy so please check that okay now what we'll do is um, we'll define something om called omega bar so we'll define omega bar to be the following so what i'm going to do is i'm going to write omega 2 as omega bar plus epsilon and omega 1 as omega bar minus epsilon okay and of course you can find out what omega bar and epsilon are uh, because you have two equations and two unknowns which is um, which will give you that omega bar is just the average of omega 1 and omega 2 okay and epsilon is the difference of the two frequencies you can see why I am putting epsilon epsilon usually denotes small quantities the reason being because I have taken the coupling to be small okay uh, where is it yeah if the coupling is small then omega 2 is also close to omega 1 okay and that's what I am doing so I am just defining omega bar which is the average of the two which will be almost omega 1 and epsilon will be very close to 0 so that's what I am doing okay now you can use um, some elementary trigonometric identity identities which i will write here so elementary trigonometric identities ti ti 
you can check that this is what you get these are so what we are what you have to use is sine omega 2 t this you can write as sine omega bar t cos of epsilon t plus cos of omega bar t sine of epsilon t okay and then you have sine of omega 1 t which you can again the same expression um, cos of epsilon t minus cos of omega bar t sine of epsilon t okay that you can check easily and you substitute in q1 and q2 these things so here you go to here okay and substitute what your sine omega 1 t is from here and what your sine omega 2 t is from here and check that you get the following substituting in q1 and q2 we get the following we get q1 as v naught over 2 okay 1 over omega 1 plus 1 over omega 2 cos epsilon t times sine omega bar t then you have one more term which is 1 over omega 2 minus 1 over omega 1 that's good sine epsilon t cos omega bar t that's what you get for q1 and let me write for q2 q2 you get the same thing apart from uh, small differences let me see sine cos omega. okay so you get this 1 over omega 1 minus 1 over omega 2 i hope all the signs i have derived correctly but please check them cos epsilon t sine of omega bar t that's good minus 1 over omega 1 plus 1 over omega 2 sine epsilon t cos omega bar t okay that's what you can check now what I will do is I will put omega 1 to be close to omega 2 which is which is the case. Okay, let us say these are two very close. Now if that is the case then this term uh, the, the overall coefficient is almost 0 Okay, and similarly here. So they will drop out and in that limit of small, small uh, coupling meaning alpha is close to 0 or which is same as omega 1 is same close to omega 2 you get the q1 to be approximately v naught over omega bar cos epsilon t okay times sine of omega bar t and q2 will be almost minus v naught over omega bar sin epsilon t and cos omega bar t okay that looks good let's check whether it it, it is um, looking reasonable so let's say we put time t equal to 0 in this and clearly both of the pendulum are at rest because this one becomes 0 here and this one will become 0 here so they are both at rest now let's uh, find out the um, q1 dots and q2 dots the velocities at any time please uh, check that this is what you get v naught cos epsilon t times cos of omega bar t and q2 dot you get minus v naught sine of epsilon t sine omega bar t okay 
let's put t equal to 0 in this this one does not go to 0 it becomes v naught because this factor is becomes 1 this factor becomes 1 and you have v naught which is correct which is what we did and q2 dot at time 2 equal to 0 will be 0 because of this factor so the q2 is at rest at time t equal to 0 which is consistent with what we expected now uh, let's see what is happening as time goes on okay as time goes on so initially um, uh, bo both are at rest which is fine also note one thing before I say more this one these two um, I mean all the four basically these are more these are like oscillations okay uh, with frequency omega bar but the amplitude here is changing with time okay so you can think of uh, an envelope within which these oscillations are happening that is what you must have encountered earlier also in some other contexts like uh, in your waves and oscillations or or optics they're the same thing so this is an amplitude which decreases with time and within which uh, these other rapid oscillations are happening see this will decrease slowly with time because the epsilon here is small so the change in the amplitude with time is small okay so it it also oscillates the amplitude also oscillates okay so you can see that at t equal to 0 q1 dot is something okay and q2 dot is 0 so the first pendulum is moving with the velocity v0 and the second one is stationary and as time goes on and you move to time t equal to let's look at here here okay um, pi by 2 epsilon Okay, I should use the same epsilon. I should use the same epsilon, so pi by 2 epsilon. Then this will become cos of pi by 2. Okay, so which means that by the time you reach this time, t equal to, let's call it capital T, this envelope has been shrinking because see it starts with the its maximum value at t equal to 0 cos 0 is 1 and it keeps going down with time and eventually the envelope goes down to 0 and your q1 dot is 0 then but in the same time this envelope has been increasing right because it starts at 0 the amplitude and as time goes on it increases and but when you reach at sine of pi by 2 which is what it is this is doing this will envelope will take its maximum value and uh, the q2 dot will be non-zero okay you can find out what it will be but this will be non-zero so when you arrive at this time the first pendulum has stopped and only the second pendulum is moving okay and as time progresses this will keep repeating so after another time pi by 2 epsilon has uh, passed again the first one will start oscillating and the second one will be at rest okay and this is what um, happens here so what you see is that the kinetic energy okay is oscillating between the two pendulum okay and this is what you call the phenomenon of beats okay that's nice and yeah, we'll continue with uh, some more uh, discussion on small oscillation so based on the discussion that we have had till now we are ready to write down the general solution for a n dimensional system which is undergoing some um, small oscillations near its equilibrium configuration okay so for a n dimensional system so if you 
take the Lagrangian and from that you write down the equations of motion this is what you're going to get so our equation of motion would be T i j that's your kinetic energy matrix Q j double dot of course you have second derivative and then you have the potential energy term uij qj and this is equal to zero okay um, i can write the same equation in matrix form so the same thing looks like this let me write it down on the right hand side so let me denote by this t the matrix corresponding to these elements t i j and then we have q double dot q is a, a column vector plus u okay it's a matrix again and then you have the column vector q and this should be zero okay and um, what we want to do is we want to write down the general solution for q now that's not difficult now because we have already uh, done most of the work in fact we have done all the work all we have to do is just write it down so what we'll do is we'll recall that our system behaves as if it is a collection of n independent harmonic oscillators okay i'm assuming all the frequencies to be non zero here all the uh, oscillators have non zero uh, frequencies so the picture is the following so the the system this system now if you choose the normal coordinates then it looks like the following maybe i should use some why it doesn't work yeah okay um let me take some color here something more happy okay so let's draw with this I mean these uh, pictures will they're not necessary but they do help in remembering certain aspects so here yeah, here okay so you have your system appearing as if there are I mean under the right choice of coordinates it appears as if you have several harmonic oscillators one dimensional harmonic oscillators okay and each of them will have a different frequency and i am assuming that they are non zero right now and this will be the coordinate q okay remember this is just a cartoon so um, q and so n oscillators and these q's will give you the uh, uh, the coordinate which characterizes the displacements okay very nice so now it's clear what the general solution would be it would be just a linear sum of all these um, normal coordinates now what do you have at your hand when you uh, disturb the system so you can think of that you are disturbing your system in such a way that you choose to oscillate the oscillator capital q1 such that it has a phase phi1 at time t equal to 0 and some amplitude okay so you it, it will have its own amplitude and some phase this one have will have its own amplitude and some phase and so forth okay so those are the things which you control okay they they depend on the initial conditions right because 
uh, given a one dimensional oscillator that's what the freedom you have in choosing which means the following that the kth normal coordinate i can write as ck e to the i omega k t and i should take the real part of it okay ck is complex which encodes the amplitude and the um, the e, uh, so let's say i write ck not here so the phase part of ck combines here and gives you the phase of the oscillator k and the amplitude here the the radial part gives the amplitude okay so that's what your um, uh, normal coordinate k is okay and we already have seen that the transition from not, uh, your q small q okay these coordinates to the normal coordinates is through a linear transformation okay which means i will write down um let me use q okay i should use black so my q j okay the displacement q j will be the following it will be a linear sum of all the one dimensional oscillators and uh, they will all come with some some coefficients okay xi j k so there is a summation over k implied here maybe i can make it explicit okay and these zeis will be determined by us i mean they have to, we have to calculate we don't have a control over what zi is that should be clear see what you can control is what is ck okay and ck is two quantities basically the um so if i write ck as some ak e to the i phi k so you can control what phi k is what ak is the amplitude and this but beyond that for a one dimensional oscillator there is nothing for you to choose and if you can reduce your system to n n oscillators each of them one dimensional you correspondingly choose the phi k and ak for each of them and beyond that you have no freedom left to choose anything okay which means that this xi is completely determined by the problem itself there is nothing for you to choose okay that's the point i wanted to make uh i will i will remove this now okay good mm yeah so which is basically i can write this as um xi j k times real part of maybe the next line xi j k times real part of c k e to the i omega k t note that your xi j k all these elements are also real they have to be real because your q j is are real and this part is real so this has to be real otherwise your displacements would not be real okay and i have already made the assumption that i am taking all the omegas to be non zero now i take this q j and substitute in my equation of motion okay so substitute in the equation of motion and what do i get i get the following so you already have a summation over j in this implied here you know, which i have not made explicit but now i will so i had summation over j and then i have a summation over k okay then 
your T i j here. T i j. Then you have your. I have to substitute key j. I take the second uh, derivative, which brings the i omega two times, which gives a minus omega k square. So I get z i j k. Then your real part of minus omega k square. Then you have a c k here. Then you have e to the i omega k t. And then you have your potential energy term, which gives you the following: u i j. Maybe in the I can write down in the next line plus u i j. Z i j k and then real part of c k e to the i omega k t. Okay, that's what you have. We can um, collect certain terms here and write it in the following fashion. So from here. So now I have um, summation over k, and I'm going to use a uh, matrix notation. So I'm going to um, write the summation over j using matrix notation. So this T i j. Is our matrix T okay? And z i j k. So it's basically z i is getting dotted into the T. That's the product. Let me write down, and then maybe it will be easier to see what I am trying to say here. So minus omega k square T. Z of k. I'll tell you what z of k is in a moment. Plus u z of k okay okay fine wait yeah I should have yes fine no problem e to the sorry this is c c k e to the i omega k t equal to zero. So let me tell you what z i k is. Your z i k is a column vector. You see z i k. This z i k does not carry two indices. Doesn't carry j k. It, it's only one, so it's a different quantity. And what I have done is I have defined z i k as a column vector. C o l u m n column vector whose uh, jth element. So, if you look at this vector and look at its jth element, this is z i j k. Okay, that's the definition of this column vector z i, z i of z i k. Okay, and if you um, see this um, result, this this expression. Okay, we have uh, sum over k. And on the right hand side you have zero, and each term corresponding to each k comes with a coefficient c k, which you control. Okay, and everything here in here in this uh, curly brackets is not controlled by you. So, if this entire thing has to sum up to zero, it better be that the Term in the um, curly brackets vanish. Otherwise, it is not possible to make it zero for whatever c k you choose because c k s are in your hands. Okay, so for that to happen, this um, quantity in curly brackets should vanish. And let me write it down. So this implies that your minus omega. Square. I'm just dropping the k for a moment, not for a moment. I'm just dropping it. Okay. 
So the following should happen. So T xi plus U xi should be equal to zero, okay? Because your CKs are arbitrary, in, uh, determined by the initial conditions. Okay, so that's what the xi should satisfy. As I was saying earlier, uh, here um, that these are determined by the problem, the xi case, and that's what you see now that the xi case are determined by this equation. Okay, I've just suppressed the index. And you will see immediately why I have done so. Okay, and this equation which you have here, let me write it slightly differently. You can write it as u of xi as omega square t xi. Okay, this is called a generalized eigenvalue problem. Okay, um, the normal eigenvalue problem would be like u of xi is equal to some some constant times xi. It's just a normal eigenvalue problem, but this is the this is what is called generalized eigenvalue problem. Instead of having having your right hand side being proportional to xi, you have a constant and again a matrix times the the xi. Okay, this is called generalized eigenvalue problem. Okay, now you see, um, if I give you a system and ask what are its characteristic frequencies, what are the frequencies of the normal modes, you do not have to first um, uh, put the the Lagrangian in uh, as a sum of squares, which the way I was telling you earlier. Okay, you can simply do the following. You look at this equation, okay, and from here we can conclude how to find out uh, the eigenfrequencies and it's simple because um, these are a set of linear equations let me write it down in the following form I write it as omega square t minus u okay xi equal to zero okay these are linear homogeneous equations okay how many of them are there are uh, these are how many equations okay please supply the answer here um now if this set of e this set of equations has to have a non trivial solution meaning a non trivial xi which will make this happen then it is necessary that we should have determinant of omega square t minus u equal to 0 so if you can solve this equation which is um, a polynomial equation of degree what you find here okay and then you can solve the polynomial equation and get the characteristics characteristic frequencies okay so this will give you okay it may also happen that some of your omega square turn out to be zero but well, that's fine Okay, now let's say I want to write down the most general solution to our problem where the frequencies are non-zero. Then it would be just this, this QJs. Okay, so your most general solution is is Q. Let me write down the solution in the matrix notation. So Q is a column vector here. So you had a QJ xi k uh, j k now this will become a um, column vector xi of j okay and these are anyway here so your most general solution is the following okay 
and let me make the summation over k explicit also i would request you to check that this problem okay if you are looking at this generalized eigenvalue problem the xi of k in our case is um, is a set of eigenvectors which are which are orthogonal orthogonal to each other okay you will be able to um, do this based on the discussions which we have uh, had in the last uh, couple of hours or you can also refer to some some book like goldstein okay so yeah so we have written down the general solution and we'll continue with uh, more discussion on um, harmonic oscillations or small oscillations in the next video